Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Capital Link uh, Conference this year. After a few years of remote operations, we are back live to see each other. Uh, thank you, the panelists, for being here, and thank you, Nicolas, for putting the efforts uh, to bring uh, all of us uh, together again. We are going to have a kind of hybrid panel here uh, where uh, we will have some introductory, introductory remarks by Yuri Ann Arthur, who is the Commercial Counsel for U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce uh, in, uh, in Greece. And then we are expecting uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, Miltiaris Varvichiotis and the rest of my panelists, Christos Theophilou, coming from um, the European Union, the Maritime Security and Strategy and uh, Common Information Sharing Environment, Chris McHardy, who is coming from UK, from London, she's a partner at Stephenson Hardwood, and also Mark uh, O'Neill, who is not Mark O'Neill. I don't look like Mark. Uh, is Andreas Hadzip. <laughs> But uh, he is from the same company, uh, Columbia Ship Management, and he is replacing Mark uh, um, due to unavailability. So uh, I would like to kick in and uh, have uh, Yuri uh, make introductory remarks on the issue shipping, navigating through geopolitical turbulence. Thank you very much. Kalimera sas to everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be here today representing the U.S. Embassy at the Capital Link's 12th Annual Greek Shipping Forum. I would really like to thank the Capital Link team, especially President Bornozis and Managing Director Bornozis, for your commitment to promoting U.S.-Greek trade and investment ties. And you do remarkable work. And we really appreciate you including the Embassy here today. Um, today, I sadly bring remarks from Ambassador Payet as he prepares for his departure tomorrow after a very eventful six-year tour in Greece. Um, he really wishes he could have been here today with everyone, and he sends his regards not only for today, but for continued success of Capital Link events, which he has greatly enjoyed. Ambassador Payet, as you all know, has participated in events many times, and as shipping and maritime are one of the fastest growing sectors in the Greek economy, and over the past decade, this event, this platform, has built a global reputation as a critical shipping and maritime platform, building ties among shipping professionals and industry leaders worldwide. As the ambassador concludes his ambassadorship, he is often asked a very challenging question by every Greek individual he meets. What is your favorite Greek island? He, this touchy question cannot be answered without controversy, but he actually does have an answer, which you have may, may have heard before. An unforgettable island for Ambassador Payet is the, amba is the island of Syros, and this is because of what he witnessed um, through the privatization of Neronian shipyards done by U.S. firm Onex. The shipyard went from having 180 unpaid workers to a successful enterprise with 600 well-paid workers and great sustainable business. A U.S. flag flies above the shipyard today, an unusual sight to see, but a symbol of success, hope for a better future for Greece, for the workers in the shipyard, for the community surrounding the shipyard, and for U.S. and Greek relations. This is why the this is why the island will hold a very special place in the ambassador's heart. But of course, as he sometimes mentions, we know he really likes the beaches on the other side of the island as well, which he feels are not um, promoted enough. Onyx is continuing its work in Greece with a proposal for Elefsina shipyards, as you all are likely familiar. It intends to take full ownership of the shipyard, creating jobs and bringing new business from both the commercial and defense sectors. The firm expects to create at least 150 jobs in the interim, expanding up to 1,000 jobs. The proposal includes ambitious plans for green transformation, another Cisco Onex Innovation Center, and synergies with local industries. We hope to see another success story as a solution that further ties together our nations and protects and creates jobs. Of course, I would be remiss not to mention the U.S. interests pursuing the privatization of the port of Alexandropoli, a strategic asset even before recent days. 
qualified U.S. interests are all seeking to contribute to a solution that will ensure geopolitical stability and economic viability. Many often say that we are at the peak of our relationship between the United States and Greece, but that implies that we cannot go higher, which we all disagree with. We do not believe we will see an end to this upward trajectory, and our relationship will be further strengthened by the arrival of Ambassador Tsunis, who will arrive on Saturday, and mostly due to the efforts of the Greek people who have courageously risen to meet the many challenges that have come their way. Oh, the light is stronger. There is no denying that U.S. interest in Greece continues to be strong. We are seeing sustained interest by members of U.S. Congress. Having hosted just in the past few weeks delegations led by representatives Carbajal, Connolly, and Pallone, the strong bipartisan support for Greece certainly continues. This is because Greece has proven to be a valuable U.S. partner, a pillar of regional stability, and an important energy and transportation hub capable of building bridges between NATO allies and key regional partners. The Greek response to Putin's invention of Ukraine has been vitally important. The most important aspect was the totally unambiguous position of Prime Minister Greece, who will be on the right side of history. His clear recognition that this issue is one that transcends Ukraine and goes to the whole question of international order and what the future is going to look like. President Biden, of course, cares deeply about democratic values that were born right here in ancient Athens, and he has made very clear that he is personally committed to taking the U.S.-Greece relationship to an even higher level. You are no doubt aware that President Biden will welcome Prime Minister Mitsotakis to the White House on May 16th. And Speaker Nancy Pelosi has invited the Prime Minister on behalf of the bipartisan congressional leadership to a joint meeting of Congress on May 17th. This is the highest honor our legislator can bestow upon a visiting foreign leader, and we are very excited. The tempo of our bilateral cooperation in the maritime domain has increased dramatically, including in the defense and security sector. Greece and the United States will continue to benefit from a strong relationship between our people, our governments, our businesses, which will also strengthen Greece's role as a pillar of stability, leading energy transport and commerce as a hub in southeastern Europe. It's extremely exciting for us at the U.S. Embassy to work in partnership with the Greek private and public sector during this period of tremendous growth in the U.S.-Greek relationship. As we embark on new challenges and opportunities together in 2022, I wish you a successful forum and the continued success in all of your business endeavors. I would also like to thank the distinguished panelists who will follow for a very interesting discussion, including Alternate Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Varvisiotis. Thank you very much to everyone. Greetings from the embassy and many, many Efaristopolis from Ambassador Pyatt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuri, for the positive aspects of Greece and United States relationship. We hope uh, to see more of that. And uh, I think we are ready to, to start and when uh, uh, Minister Varvitsiotis arrived, we allow me to give him uh, the floor. So, uh, starting this uh, panel, which is shipping, navigating through geopolitical turbulence, I have a couple of comments to make. Ladies and gentlemen, while we are still trying to process uh, in a recovery mode of COVID-19 pandemic, the economic impact and the energy crisis resulting from the Russian-Ukraine war is overwhelmingly impacting us, as well as the shipping industry. The shipping industry, whose purpose is to transport goods worldwide safely, timely, cost-effectively, with environmentally friendly practices and operation. And shipping has been proven flexible, resilient, adaptable to all political and geopolitical challenges and has, that have been affecting us ranging from local piracy and robbery attacks to wars and local conflicts, protectionism, regulation, sanctions, and other factors. We, as a flag administration that we uh, manage almost uh, 1,500 Greek-owned vessels, have been affected by all of these geopolitical challenges, and we try to cope 
to find solutions to accommodate the many stakeholders of the shipping industry, from the ship owner, the ship manager, all the way to the seafarer on board. Today's business environment, it looks extremely fluid. The best-led plans of logistics and shipping companies can often be derailed by unforeseeable external developments and may place at risk the ship owner's investments. But as we have all seen from past experience, turbulence and turmoil may also create risk-reward situation. To hear more on these subjects, I turn now to Christos from the European Union, and I want you to uh, talk to us how the Green Deal objectives uh, are um, uh, developed within Europe, uh, European community. Are those going to be derailed by the current conflict, and how the EU maritime security uh, strategy develops under the current uh, war circumstances in Europe? Thank you very much. Um, thanks for, for inviting me. Thank you, Mr. Bornozis, uh, for having us here as uh, DG Maritime Affairs and Fisheries representing the European Commission. Uh, I'm a newcomer. I, I, most of you haven't seen me before. Uh, my specialty uh, nowadays is maritime security, as already mentioned. So today I would like to uh, discuss a little bit about the, the sustainable blue economy agenda that we have uh, and link that to maritime security and, of course, to the European uh, Green Deal. So our sustainable blue economy agenda is exactly one year old, having been adopted in May last year, and it's designed uh, to help the blue economy contribute to the objectives of the European Green Deal. And one of the objectives which is very relevant uh, for all of us uh, here is the 90% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions for all modes of transport, including, of course, uh, maritime. Um, so in this uh, difficult transition, Um, so in this uh, difficult, um, challenging transition, the sustainable economy agenda is already contributing in various ways, uh, for example, by helping to decarbonize maritime transport and greening ports, and also by renewing the standards for ship recycling. We also have uh, the 2020 communication on sustainable and smart mobility, and the aim of this is to bring to the market by 2030 the first zero emission uh, vessels. Uh, the Fuel EU initiative is uh, designed to boost production and uptake of renewable um, forms of energy, low carbon fuels, uh, hydrogen, biofuels, etc., uh, as well as ensuring uh, electrical power supply at birth for ships. And in complement to that, the 10T regulation and the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive will ensure the deployment for the necessary refueling infrastructure. Uh, one of our bigger EU programs, InvestEU, is also highly relevant for maritime transport. Uh, this uh, supports the retrofitting and renewing of vessels with uh, zero emission or low emission technologies. And at the same time, it supports an EU industry that um, has a, a strategic advantage uh, in, in manufacturing this type of uh, equipment. So, of course, uh, the blue economy, European Green Deal, is inextricably linked to maritime security. Um, in fact, uh, we cannot have a sustainable blue economy without a secure and safe maritime space. Uh, and this uh, high level of maritime security is in fact a prerequisite also for the strategic interests of the EU in the maritime domain. Uh, there I mean free freedom of navigation, external border control, supply of essential materials and so on. Uh, so since 2014 we have the maritime sec uh, security strategy and an action plan that goes along with it. And this is the framework through which the EU protects these interests in full respect, of course, of international law, in particular UNCLOS. 
uh, our maritime security strategy uh, streamlines uh, maritime security into all other EU um, uh, policies. And this links in as well into the common security and defense policy, uh, which has uh, been deploying uh, various naval operations. You, of course, heard of Operation Irini in the Mediterranean, uh, and I think everybody is familiar with Atalanta in the Western Indian Ocean. And through these operations, we developed a lot of um, expertise and uh, technical, ca technical capabilities which allow the EU to uh, deal with very complex maritime challenges. Uh, and of course, you're all aware of the increasing um, amount of maritime uh, crime, uh, piracy, armed robbery, kidnap for ransom in the Gulf of Guinea in the last few years. So in, in response to this, uh, the EU launched in January 2021 the Coordinated Maritime Presences uh, Mechanism. Um, and this involves the assets, naval vessels of member states that were already present in the area. So far, uh, 10 vessels have taken part in this uh, coordinated maritime presence in the Gulf of Guinea, and uh, these, these are um, vessels from uh, Denmark, Spain, France, Italy, and Portugal. And uh, in the past year, we've seen a reversal in the, in the um, trend, in the upward, previously upward trend in these maritime crimes. Uh, final word about the uh, update of the EU Maritime Security Strategy and its action plan. Uh, we have just uh, launched this update. Uh, we've already been consulting the EU member states and various experts. Um, our objective is to update uh, the strategy in a way that will allow it to be future proof and uh, to tackle specific threats, uh, some of them, some of which are new or evolving, like cyber threats, hybrid threats, the link between uh, the climate crisis and maritime security, but also to ensure the uh, protection of, of resource flows, freedom of navigation, and protecting the interests of EU member states within their maritime zones, and of course, improving uh, maritime uh, surveillance. Uh, this um, update will be ready to present uh, in the first quarter of 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Christos. Um, allow me now to uh, pass the floor to uh, Minister Miltiades Varvichiotis for his remarks. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, well, geopolitics is is back in the front line news. And uh, for the first time after the end of the Cold War, we see a shift of power in, uh, in a struggle over power in Europe. And this is uh, something that actually, uh, if we have talked last year, it wouldn't be uh, neither mentioned in this panel. I mean, uh, nobody would have predicted uh, one year ago that uh, there would be a war in Europe, there would be such a class of uh, uh, such a great class, such a great loss of life, uh, such a destruction of a sovereign state, of a big sovereign state of uh, Europe, although it doesn't belong to the European Union, but still aspiring to become one member of the European Union, like Ukraine, a major economic uh, provider uh, for European Union and the world uh, because of its uh, grain and, uh, 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 and, and of its grains uh, exports. Uh, this has... Um, has caused uh, several things. First of all, it has caused a humanitarian uh, disaster. Uh, more than uh, four million Ukrainians have fled into European Union. Another six million of Ukrainians have been internally displaced persons. And the fights are, st are, are still going on. Uh, last night, we saw the horrible image of uh, uh, a thermic bomb attack uh, a thermic bomb attack at uh, the uh, Azovstal factory, that it was the last defended, uh, defended area uh, in the uh, city of Mariupol. Furthermore, we have seen for the first time a great shift of power within European Union. European Union, for the first time it's in its history, stood up in a geopolitical crisis and actually implemented timely 
and uh, a very strong, not a very, so far five strong packages of, of sanctions. Uh, the sixth uh, package is under preparation, and I think that everybody is wondering whether it's going to include or not include the uh, shipping uh, and uh, the shipping industry into that. We can talk a little bit later about that, but uh, for the first time we see European uh, Union reacting as a geopolitical actor, and um, uh, it has also uh, agreed to step up and build up its defense capabilities, and in the same time we have seen uh, what we were considering was not so relevant for our neighborhood, NATO, to becoming stronger with the aspiration of uh, uh, Sweden and Finland to join NATO, and at the same time uh, for uh, Denmark to join the military forces of European Union. The third thing has to do with the role of the United States. United States are back in business in Europe. Um, the alignment between the uh, EU and uh, the United States is, is even stronger than before. Um, uh, after what has happened in Afghanistan, that everybody reacted a little bit uh, um, difficultly uh, on how much coordination there was between the two sides of the Atlantic. Now we are talking about an absolute alignment among the, the two actors, so the United States and European Union, and an extreme and uh, extreme level of cooperation uh, from both sides. Uh, a fourth thing is uh, the elections in Europe, and especially what has happened in France. We have seen that uh, nationalistic approach uh, uh, didn't prevail. Um, the uh, communal approach has prevailed, and this is very important for, for, the, uh, for the next uh, period, including the, the fact that uh, Germany, for the first time in its history, um, agreed to invest in defense capabilities to disassociate itself from uh, what has been a traditional uh, policy of the German state, and this was the Ostpolitik, the the close cooperation uh, with Russia. Um, this has come to an end uh, also because of the uh, end of the uh, North, Stream, uh, North uh, Stream 2, which would be the pipeline providing for more gas into the German uh, economy. And the final point has to do with uh, what we feel as a common area of imposing uh, these economic sanctions and where these sanctions end to. Um, we have definitely agreed to these uh, five packages. We are still discussing uh, the sixth package that has to do with the ban of Russian oil from our markets, which will definitely cause a great uh, a great uh, loophole in the Russian economy. Uh, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't predict that there wouldn't be other markets uh, that this oil may be directed, but definitely uh, Europe is the consumer of almost 70% uh, of Russian energy exports, and this should be taken into account. Uh, this would definitely uh, have turbulences over the, the price of oil as traded uh, in parts in different parts of the world, and this would uh, make uh, your business even more interesting. Uh, but at the same time, it will definitely show the determination that we are not there to finance Mr. Putin's war. Uh, said all that, um, I want to tell you that uh, there is a discussion and there is in the frontline news uh, today about whether uh, we, are, uh, we are willing or not willing to, to accept the sanctions to be imposed uh, on the maritime and shipping uh, sector. Uh, we are very reluctant. Uh, we are very reluctant. Uh, we have uh, said from the beginning that uh, we are not willing to, to agree to sanctions that may uh, may harm uh, ourselves, so we are still in the negotiating phase on to see where this uh, will come to an end. 
with all this, uh, uh, I don't think that I have to, you know, I, I just put uh, the, headli the headlines uh, in, uh, in the responding to, to what, is, uh, what is nowadays the biggest challenge. Uh, the only thing that I would like to say is that we are getting in, in a period uh, uh, that uh, there is a great reshuffle uh, in the world. And uh, in this period uh, that we don't see a clear end, first of all, to, to the war and what will be the end game of Russia, and this is something that everybody is puzzled about, where and when this is going to stop, uh, actually uh, provides for more instability, uh, uh, geopolitical instability, but also economic instability. Because uh, until now we haven't felt all the consequences of the lockdowns imposed during the pandemic. You see what's happening outside China with uh, thousands of ships waiting uh, to be loaded and uh, with the impact uh, that, has, uh, that that has to the supply chain all over the world. Uh, in the same time, uh, without actually uh, coping with the aftermath of COVID that also has produced this high inflation rate unprecedented for uh, strong currencies uh, like uh, the euro, um, uh, we see this uh, geopolitical crisis. So uh, I think that uh, this geopolitical crisis definitely is going to, to, to have an impact uh, on, uh, on the grain supply in the world. This is something definite. And this will cause, for sure, a price rise uh, in, in grains that will also be a factor of instability in other parts of the world, namely uh, Northern Africa, uh, Africa itself, and uh, parts of Asia. And this will, uh, we believe that this will cause also uh, a new migratory movements that will also cause another source of instability uh, for, uh, for Europe and our country. Uh, <coughs> May I, since you are here, so is it all doom and gloom or there is some optimism? Down well, the road. I, I, I mean, I would, well, that's the question. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to be uh, the, the doom prophet uh, here, but uh, uh, what I uh, what I try to do is uh, put in titles what's the situation. So uh, I don't think that it's a period that it, we have to be extremely optimistic. It's a period that we have to be extremely cautious. And um, uh, although there are there are potential. Uh, potential gains uh, through this uh, time of instability. Uh, in the same time, it's also uh, the, the, the threats that they are out there um, are very severe in order not to be taken, uh, you know, uh, lightly. Uh, let me say what I find as an important, as an important uh, optimistic option uh, or the optimistic window in that situation. The optimistic window, it has to do with our commitment to further unite the European Union. And this is uh, something that's happening, it's happening fast. Over the last uh, two years, we have seen uh, European Union growing, growing and uh, becoming more mature in dealing with crisis. Uh, from the crisis, the economic crisis of 2008-2009 that ended up uh, with having a European Union that it was ill-prepared to deal with such a kind of crisis. Uh, nowadays, we have seen uh, European Union actually dealing on a timely way uh, to the, the crisis that it has faced. Pandemic, we had European vaccination. We have the recovery and the resilience uh, fund that actually helped a lot both the economies, uh, helped the recovery and uh, strengthen uh, the euro. And of course, we had the digital uh, pass that it was uh, something that it has been proven very helpful in dealing with the situation, something that it hasn't happened, for example, in the United States or other parts of the world. And we were one, one step ahead in dealing with that. Uh, now, 
we have uh, we have uh, we have come together in imposing sanctions. We have come together in building up our defense capabilities. We have come up to to voice out uh, more firm political messages, and we have come up to to understand that uh, we need also Europe to act as uh, one in terms of challenges uh, and just threats like uh, the the Russian threat is uh, is uh, is now being responded by European Union so i think that uh, this is the optimistic part that we are becoming stronger and more united thank you the alarm thank is you. Here. <laughs> now Didn't like that <laughs> thank you for this uh, holistic uh, approach and perspective and uh, now let's let's I want to move now in a in a in a shipping company aspect I want to ask uh, Andreas who is uh, managing Columbia ship management okay we have the status quo as it is and as it's developed what do you do as a ship managing company how do you manage now after pandemic you did excellent I can follow you what do you do now with the geopolitical situation? Michalim will allow me to say that uh, after Mr. Uh, Barbiciotis and uh, Mr. Like you, Anna, and uh, yeah. the, the U.S. Embassy uh, uh, representative, whatever I say, I think is not so relevant. But allow me just um, a couple of remarks. Um, the the overall uncertainty which has been created and trying obviously to stay positive. It's a situation whereby moving into shipping, and I talk about shipping, has created and will create more opportunities for uh, ship owners and, and operators. And I believe that the Greek shipping uh, community will uh, be able to position itself um, positively into the situation. Um, during times of crisis, the fleet uh, of the Greek ship owners uh, uh, increases typically, and um, I personally believe that, uh, uh, and again trying to remain positive, is that this will continue also during this period. Um, now, on the day-to-day -day shipping operations, obviously all these things that happened the last two, three years, they created the perfect storm, um, thanks to the um, uh, regulatory body, bodies, the sanctions, uh, thanks to all the problems that we are facing every day at different ports. Um, we need our uh, lawyers, we need our advisors, uh, we need, unfortunately, um, to concentrate on keeping things in line with the regulations and making sure that the basic things that before uh, we were able to do without even thinking really like a crew change. Now they became um, administrative uh, challenges and, um, and we see this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we realize that we have to be flexible. We have to be able to um, help the ship owners, the operators, the seafarers uh, to cope through the situation. And I'll give you one remark because I see the time actually is, is gone. On the very first uh, days of, uh, of the pandemic, we all somehow um, we were scared and we all went home. We started working from home and we didn't really know how we would manage. We managed. We survived that. And, um, and, and it, it's as simple as that. There was no other way. And now we have the war. A couple of uh, weeks ago, I remember myself, uh, I was checking the, the news three times a day, and I was on the video call with our office in, in Odessa maybe two times a day. Now it has become two times a week, and, um, and somehow it's becoming their own normality. On the shipping side, our job, everybody involved in shipping is resilient. We are able to, to cope. Um, the, regular, uh, uh, the regulatory bodies, the governments, they do not always make it easy. As a small remark, I would like to refer to the, the need for the seafarers to become key workers worldwide. And um, we will continue managing the ships. We will continue making sure that the trade uh, uh, is, uh, is not uh, disturbed to, the, to an extent that the welfare of the people is not affected. And um, 
Uh, again, remaining positive, I believe that Greek shipping will uh, not come out worst out of this situation. Thank you, Andreas, for the remarks. Now, Kirsty, as you see, I left you last because everybody talk on sanctions. So, a part of what you are going to say on sanctions, I would like to ask you, are sanctions necessary in shipping and are they effective? Uh, <clears throat> two interesting questions. Uh, are they necessary? Um, but looking at the purpose of sanctions, the purpose of sanctions, particularly in relation to uh, Russia, is to put pressure on Russia to try and uh, cripple their economy uh, as a result of their invasion of the Ukraine. Um, I think they are necessary. The question you raise as to whether they are effective um, is perhaps a separate question. Now, the, the, the sanctions are far-reaching, and at the moment, <clears throat> whilst they um, have certainly affected all of us, I think, in our day-to-day -day business, where we're all having to undertake a greater amount of due diligence, I suspect there is no one in the room that hasn't been affected um, by the, the sanctions, either uh, in relation to uh, their customers, their customers within the bank, um, their shipping customers, those uh, very good customers who suddenly have found themselves uh, designated individuals and how people then re remove themselves from that. Um, there is also the impact of the on shipping directly where there are now, uh, as the Minister mentioned, these um, bans on uh, the importation of certain goods into the Union. Um, at its lowest level, there is a ban on luxury goods such as Russian uh, vodka and caviar. Um, at its highest, we've seen the ban on the importation of solid fuels uh, such as wood and coal. And uh, as the minister mentioned, there is now uh, it is being discussed as to whether um, there will be a ban on the importation of Russian oil. Now, the UK has already indicated that it is going to ban the importation of Russian oil, um, but there is a very, very long wind down period. Um, it will be interesting to see what the EU and each of its member states does in terms of that ban, um, but there has been an indication uh, that European vessels and companies uh, would be prohibited, and it was interesting to hear the Minister's insight on this, would be what has been tabled is um, a ban on European vessels and companies from providing services and crucially from insurance being provided uh, in relation to the transportation of Russian oil and refined oil products. Um, so going back to the question, are they necessary? Um, I think they are necessary. There is a separate question as to whether they are effective. Um, because of, for example, many member states' uh, reliance on uh, energy from Russia, there are necessary carve-outs. And to an extent, that does undermine the effectiveness of those sanctions. Um, I have seen already the proposal that it, if there is a full ban on the importation of Russian oil into the EU, countries such as Hungary will have a general exemption where they are fully, virtually fully reliant on uh, Russian uh, energy products. Um, and there is um, also a question of whether the law of what we call the law of unintended consequences. Um, there, it's been very headline grabbing, particularly in the UK, of all of uh, the sanctioning of uh, the oligarchs, not least because uh, Chelsea fans were uh, quite upset when they couldn't attend their games. Um, but super yachts have been seized. Um, but one of the things that our firm has been involved in with the London insurance market is where those super yachts uh, have um, war policies on them, which in eventually may trigger very large claims through the London market and which could potentially have very serious ramifications for the London market, which I suspect policymakers did not think about when they were um, looking to sanction and place pressure on Mr Putin and his allies. 
Um, so sanctions are here to stay. Uh, we are going to have to continue to navigate them. It's certainly going to increase what we all have to do uh, in order to, co to comply, ensure that we have all of the adequate protections in our contracts in case uh, our customers, um, businesses are sanctioned. Um, whether they are effective, we will have to wait and see because it's not going to happen overnight. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, we are running out of time, but I would like to give uh, Minister Varvichiotti the final word uh, on, uh, on Greece shipping uh, throughout this uh, geopolitical crisis. Uh, uh, how do you see it? Well, first of all, I would say that uh, Greek shipping has developed over the last years, and this is, uh, this is true. It has uh, acquired more and more tonnage, it has acquired more and more developed ships, it has acquired the one dominant position in the LNG carriers, which are very, uh, uh, let's say, very lucrative at the, at the moment. Um, uh, so uh, we are talking about uh, uh, the Greek shipping that has developed from a second-hand market to a new building market, uh, uh, domina dominating the European uh, shipping and maintaining its uh, top position for the global shipping. So this is a great success altogether. This has happened, uh, this has happened, uh, and what we have seen in the history of shipping is that all the crises actually made the Greek shipping even stronger. Um, I was uh, talking to some friends and I was puzzling myself to see how this crisis will definitely be in profit of the Greek shipping, which is something that uh, we would like to see. Um, I see that uh, probably there are going to be more opportunities in bringing in uh, LNG into Europe, uh, diversify the, the energy resources uh, from the pipelines, uh, both for, uh, for oil and for, uh, uh, and for gas, uh, and this will definitely develop. And what other, uh, one third thing that uh, actually is going to happen is going, uh, I believe that it is going to also diversify the imports uh, and the, the, uh, the resources, the, the, uh, the resources of, uh, of metals and um, uh, ore uh, from other parts of the world. So we are going to see a new uh, uh, new providers coming into the European market than the Russian provider that it, some part was coming by ship, but a great part was coming by train or pipelines as well. So this is going to be a period full of opportunities and uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, our capable in, uh, shipping industry will actually uh, make a uh, make good use of these opportunities. Thank you, and with this positive remark by uh, Minister Varvichiotis, I would like a positive <laughs> remark on <laughs> Greek shipping. You wanted a positive remark. Right. Uh, thank you, the panelists. Thank you, Nicolas, for the savings of time of the conference. Uh, we will be available if anybody would like to talk to us during the breaks. Thank you all and for your attention, and please uh, join me to uh, thank the